Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dinesh and uh, Rajeshwari, who invited me for this presentation. <laughs> what you heard from Andy is a much broader picture. And uh, what I will do is uh, give a very narrow picture of a technology developer who has been looking for innovations. And um, I must admit that I will stick to my, uh, this quote that I'm wearing for today as to a technology developer, although you will see in tomorrow's presentation with Dr. Balchandra that we look at the grassroots innovation as well, but I'm not going to speak about anything about that. I'm just making a disclaimer that I also see the other side, but I'm, I'm putting on this viewpoint. Uh, when our institute uh, celebrated its 100th year, year last year, and uh, when it said what it was doing for its society, it listed the top 20 innovations. The top four were from our, from our center, and all of them were bioenergy technologies, namely the uh, wood burning stoves, the improved wood burning stoves, the biomethanation technology, the, the uh, gasification technology, and the low energy buildings. When we started, uh, about uh, 30, 35 years back, we were looking for sustainable development, and the sustainability filters for all the technology that we were to develop were very, very clearly sort of discussed among the entire uh, people in the society. And uh, to make it short, this, this, uh, these filters you could see in uh, Professor Amulya Reddy's uh, very earliest document as to why a center like ours should have been developed. So in that, he justifies that a sustainable technology had to address the basic needs, starting from the uh, needs of the neediest, provides equitable access, and that point of time, energy. I also mix up energy very closely here. And uh, it is expected to maximize the use of local material skills and knowledge, lead to empowerment of the users, especially the vulnerables. It must be environmentally sound. You please look where environmental soundness comes very late in the uh, debate. Then it should lead to improve human <laughs> dignity and um, should improve the skill and the knowledge base of the location and create and maximize local value addition. These were the kind of filters that were put, conditions that were criteria that were put to say that if you develop any technology, this should be, it should pass these kind of uh, set of filters. So um, I will discuss only three, uh, one technology in depth and other two in uh, some kind of uh, passing. When we talk about um, bioenergy, uh, why we uh, narrow down on bioenergy uh, uh, wants uh, requires some kind of explanation. We find that in a country like India, the largest used uh, fuel and energy resource is biomass. And for these 800 million people, if you really want to create a low carbon path and with a lot, lot of low carbon innovations, it must be based on biomass as the primary fuel. And so the technologies that you can do with that, um, that you can use them for gets limited because of the properties of fuel. And when you, when you find that 90% of the primary energy is used for cooking on very poor quality stoves, the obvious choice that you will make uh, when you want to, <clears throat> as a technologist, to say, OK, how do I give a better uh, fuel using this kind of a primary fuel, then it automatically your choice narrows down to making biogas from all types of soft biomass. And for the larger um, uh, loads, peak loads, then the other option would become gasifier. And in a typical rural setting, the kind of energy in upwards of five kilowatt loads would be from, coming from uh, the demand from irrigation as well as rural industrialization. Of course, buildings in rural areas too require a lot of energy. And unlike in the West, it is not the maintenance energy that is very large, but the energy that gets into making a building. For especially, for example, when you make cement, when you make bricks, the energy that gets invested. That also is carbon-based, so you have to look at low carbon this way also. Biogas seems to be the ideal fuel which provides a lot of uh, interesting qualities. Uh, in, the, in the previous slide, we told about it is, uh, it reduces the drudgery of collecting fuel. It has a low carbon footprint and it's development uh, driven. It reduces the overall CO2 emissions, especially when you have a lot of dung in to deal with. And when uh, we look at biogas as an option, it's a 100 year old technology in this country. 1896 is the first plant that we built. And the the, at the field level, a lot of, at the grassroots level, a lot of effort has gone into improving this over a period of time. And uh, <clears throat> what is being justified today is that each um, biogas plant that you build, especially from cattle dung, it can avoid four tons of CO2. CO2 and uh, if you look at it at $20 per ton, then you talk about $80 equivalent of carbon emission, certified emission reduction. 
So when we post this to a development uh, person or especially a bank, we say, look, this costs 80, 18,000 rupees and you can recover the cost only from carbon financing. Whereas on the development dimension, we face, put a different picture. We talk about <clears throat> the pre-puberty women uh, who are forced to collect the fuel and consequently lose out on education. And we are trying to say that the biogas plant or the kind, these kind of low-carbon technologies should also lead to livelihoods. It also should improve the skills. And amongst other things also, when you cook on biogas, you're talking about not being exposed to smoke and consequently lung-based uh, problems, uh, respiratory problems. Whereas when we talk to the same thing to, uh, uh, in the economics, we only look at what it does in terms of carbon, uh, but don't look at the kind of uh, advantage we get from the others, from the development dimensions. It's hardly and ever costed. <clears throat> now look at what kind of innovations has been thrown up. I'm just taking two examples. Both the people who have developed these technologies are my friends, and it is not a, nothing against them. But when we talk about innovations, uh, low carbon innovations for development, then you see where the problems come in. Most of, both these uh, devices are made in plastic. So it does, and it will, be, it will be made in a, in a large industrial complex. So you see the local value addition uh, component goes up, it's marginal. There are hardly any local materials that's going to be used. It will not lead to any great development of skills, knowledge, etc. So that's going to be very, if, if at all, the, dis, at the dissemination phase, somebody comes and goes away, it's an ephemeral phenomena. And then what do you do with secondary waste? You're going to be thrown with a lot of plastics because all these are going to have a short life. It doesn't uh, provide for local support, service, skills, some kind of infrastructure. So uh, the one I show you on, on the right uh, is uh, yeah, uh, is the one that is developed by Dr. Carvey in RT. So it's made from two syntax tanks. It's a very interesting innovation. It reduces the uh, difficulty in having quality. This is made from a centralized plant from the syntax company. What, what we dream really is that the biogas plant should function like a keystone technology, around which you should have a large number of livelihood options. Now, what you see in these green boxes on this is, sorry. Can I have a pointer or something? What's the pointer? That's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side uh, in green is that the, the material that's the mouse is shifting the uh, slides further on. It's too sensitive. So, uh, so the, what you could do is from the digested material on the right-hand side, the large box, you could convert them to mushrooms, to vermicompost, fiber for cloth, especially for using banana as a primary feed. Compost, of course, is no well-known, rooting medium. And uh, you can also make it as a microbial inoculant carrier, especially like uh, a large number of microbial inoculants. Lignin formaldehyde can be a small industry product, biofilm support to start new bioreactors, fiber for paper. With a liquid on the blue side, is you can you, uh, extract the liquid out, make a pest repellent. You can uh, use it for aquaculture and algal cultures, and um, especially for raising fish. And on the gray side on the top left is from the gas. If you have a little surplus, then you can use it for fumigating all your grain without any pesticide residue. You can use it as an auto fuel by compressing it. Today, there are lots of technologies to do that. And into the future, we can look at into, especially in rural areas, what we're looking at is less than one kilowatt power situation. So just over four slides. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that these are what, this is what we would have liked to see as people working in this area to have been thrown up as grassroots technologies, coming up from the people, ideas, wonderful ideas coming up and somebody trying it out. Now, I'm not saying that these are not done. I mean, this is what we have done. And from this point onwards, we expect that more such te uh, technologies should come up from the grassroots. Now, what you see in this slide is that on the top left is the digested material that's been brought out and dried in the sun. It's mixed up with a little bit of inoculum for uh, growing mushrooms. And on the right, obviously, such a large uh, yield in mushrooms. The point one is making here is that if this is becomes the the biogas production, the compost production becomes secondary. It becomes a part of the deal. It, it, uh, it provides so much of value addition. I'm here, I'm talking only in cash, but it doesn't mean that the other forms of uh, value addition doesn't exist. So with four kgs of dry matter in, on a daily basis, that's what is required to run this plant. 
you get 1.5 kilograms of digested material from which you have about four and a half kilos of mushrooms produced every day, which means on a daily basis you are talking about a value addition of 100 rupees. So you are talking about a payback in less than six months. These kind of things are possible, but for various reasons have not actually emerged in the grassroots. I go to a, a second technology, which is a reasonably, again, well-known technology, the biomass uh, gasification. It's a thermochemical decomposition into producer gas. Now, this application with any kind of woody material, which, has, which we need not go back to soil as humus, but only the nutrients have to go back, could be used for producer gas. And this technology has been spread in the, in the country again. Here comes a very difficult problem that all the gasifiers produced are economic or viable only after a 20 kilowatt size. So the innovations that are required here is not in terms of technology alone, but how do we put these kind of devices in a, in a, in a social environment where a combined form of entrepreneurship is required, where, uh, where a very different understanding of entrepreneurship is required. Typically, if you run this as a, on a commercial basis, then the power and try to sell power, it comes to something like 10 or 12 rupees per kilowatt hour. But instead, if you provide an energy service in which the management component is borne by the people themselves, then the cost comes very low to about three, three and a half rupees, and then it becomes affordable. So the innovation is not merely in technology. And I, th I think ba Dr. Balchandra will talk about it tomorrow, something about it. Of course, uh, uh, there's also, we spend a lot of energy that's getting into our buildings. If you see the development of buildings, uh, building technology within Delhi, 30 years back and today, you see there's a lot more glass, there's a lot more air conditioning. And if somebody like uh, Dr. Ashok Lal would be talking to you, he will say that there's more heat pumped out into Delhi than it would have been if you didn't have the ACs. I mean, your, your local temperature has risen by five degrees merely because of using inefficient uh, air conditioning building. So the quantity of energy, especially carbon-based energy, that's getting into keeping such kind of buildings is increasing. And you need to look at uh, how, do, how do we alter this. And uh, innovations in this, again, has not come very, very as rapidly as we expected. Uh, on the one side, I just want to make a few concluding uh, remarks. Just have two slides. First of all, if you look at uh, low technologies and innovations in low technologies, especially that passes the sustainable development filter, you, don't, you cannot have one such set of technologies. You need a whole lot of innovations that are put together that can pass the criteria. One innovation itself, by itself, will not be able to meet your sustainable development aspirations that you have. As we perceive today, uh, the innovations as we perceive today. A single innovation can best provide you something like a marginal or incremental change but sustainable, our concept of sustainable development requires a, a very large number of such innovations to happen, and it has to happen in the right direction, in the direction that we think. So single innovations, if you are looking for, yes, it's good to uh, support them, but you also need to have what is your sustainable development path. And of course, this is the last slide which um, Professor Amulya Reddy used to keep behind him, the poster of the chimpanzee. and. Uh, uh, and it carried, this is not the original picture, but the picture was almost similar. It said, just when I found answers to the, all the life's questions, they changed the questions. Now, this is a very interesting reality that's happened in my lifetime in the 30 years. When we started looking at alternatives, by the time we re uh, prepared the alternatives, the whole scenario in the rural areas had changed. And it's happening so fast today, because when we think we have solved a large number of our energy problems with new technologies, now, there is another class of problems that are facing us because there are so many more options being thrown at urban areas, especially poor carbon, uh, poor carbon technologies, I would say. And that is making a, a great temptation to rural uh, users who also want to copy. Now, when, so when you look at, um, if you ask what is really the problem, then you see the, the rate at which the new uh, science, new technologies, new inventions that are coming uh, at the rate at which it's coming, is, is becoming very low. And uh, it seems that in the beginning, the, our academia and R&D institution put these kind of topics prior, as a priority. And so you had a large number of interactions. But today, that's slowly uh, going off. And so this is going to be a, a real bottleneck, because the number of people who had experience between both theory and having burned their fingers in the field, that kind of people are becoming few people. So you have a lot of people who can uh, uh, espouse a lot of uh, interesting theories, 
You have people who can work in the ground, in the, on the ground, but you do not have people who can give you direction. Because unless you have both this kind of experience, the direction doesn't come in. And again, we do, we, as Andy also very clearly mentioned, we, don't have, we cannot have a single path for sustainable development. So obviously, you cannot have a single bundle of sustainable technologies either, uh, innovations either. You need a much larger bundle. Thank you. Thank you.